Hello and welcome to the Raw podcast brought to you by the Sunderland Echo, Joe Nicholson and James Copley here, uh, reacting to last night's 2-1 defeat for Sunderland against West Brom Jalbion. Sunderland did take the lead in the first half, Ahmed Diallo scoring another goal from the penalty spot, but it was two substitutes for West Brom, which turned the game around, Tom Rogic and Daryl DK scoring. Um, to make it a frustrating night for Tony Mowbray's side. James, kind of, what were your reflections on the game and um, what are your kind of thoughts um, a day after? Um, my reflections are that I'm still quite cold. It was a very chilly yeah. evening last night. Fair play to anybody who uh, ventured out to the stadium of light because it was absolutely Baltic at one point. I thought Sunderland were fairly decent in, in the first half. I thought Ahmad Diallo looked good. Alex Pritchard was pulling the strings. I thought Lugo Nine was very good at the back. Uh, there was only really that one moment where Danny Bart misjudged the ball um, and then he fouled his man. There was men covering, but he's lucky he did get that foul. Um, otherwise, the guy could have been away, but there was men covering, hence why it was only a, a yellow card for Danny Bart. But I, I thought other than that, West Brom didn't really trouble too much in the in the in the first half. Sunderland did well. Obviously, Ahmad won the penalty with a lovely one too with Luke Nine, who was was great in the first half. And then the second half, West Brom tweaked it slightly. Um, the manager must have you know must have got into them at half time because they improved. Sunderland, you felt sat far too deep. Really, um, spoke to Dan Neil after the game. And he was talking about Sunderland need to need to get out more, and 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 Mowbray touched upon it as well in his post match press conference. Not trying to sit on a on a on a lead, he doesn't want Sunderland to do that. He wants them to press from the front. Um, but in in fairness to West Brom, they did improve, and they have some good players as well. There's internationals in there. I know Tom Rogic didn't go to the World Cup; he wasn't selected, but. West Brom's new manager, Corberan, was saying after the game that that sort of lit a fire under him. And you're looking at the likes of Jed Wallace, experienced championship player. There's a, there's a couple of other internationals in and around the side. So it was never going to be an easy game. But you just feel if Sunderland had performed to the potential over 90 minutes, they could have, they could have won that game. Um, and I, I don't know what you think, Joe, but I'm... I'm sort of a bit baffled to what happened to Sunderland at Sunderland in the second half. You know, West Brom improved, you can say that, but it wasn't it felt very much as if Sunderland were the architects of their own downfall in, in some degree. I mean mm. that I mean the equalizing goal was was really poor from a defensive standpoint, although it is a good finish. You know, Clark doesn't do cover himself in, in much glory in terms of stopping the cross. Um Ellis Sims isn't anywhere near a man despite being back. He switches off Pritchard's in no man's land or nine tries to get out, but he can't affect the game. Um, it just felt like Sunderland were too deep, too congested and, and they switched off in the second half. Yeah, I think it's, it's a theme as well that we've seen, especially at the stadium. I was having a look just before we came on and Sunderland have led four times at home at half time at the stadium light and they haven't won any of them. And it's a theme that we have now seen a couple of times. So there was the, the game against Coventry the, the first day of the season. There was the QPR game. Um, they were both under Alex Neal. And then there's been the Burnley game where they led 2-0. And then last night where they've had the lead at, at half time and they've not been able to kick on. And, and Mowbray was kind of saying after how I thought in the first half in particular that they did press really well. Um, but there was a, a significant drop off in the second half. Now, is that a mentality issue? Is that the players are tired because it's hard to kind of press for 90 minutes, but it's something we've seen at home and interestingly away from home when they have led at half time, they've been able to win on all three occasions. I think it was Stoke, Huddersfield and Birmingham. So what kind of the, the reasoning is, maybe it's a mixture of, of a number of things, but there was definitely a, a significant drop off in the second half. Sunderland weren't able to press as high up the pitch. I think, as you mentioned, that was partly down as well to, to West Brom's quality. Um, and Sunderland weren't able to kick on. Mowbray was saying that he, he made the sub bring on Jack Clark to try and give them more kind of an outlet on the break, but the substitutes didn't work. And West Brom, I think, took advantage of of their substitutes now that you can make five subs. Mm. Carlos Corbran brought on four substitutes before the 65th minute, I think it was, and two of them scored in DK and Rogic, kind of showed their strength on the bench, and they made the most of that kind of change of the rules with having the five subs and, and affected the game. So, you know, they're, they're kind of things that... Sunderland have to try and stop that trend. I don't know kind of what you think of, 
of what is the reason why Sunderland are sitting back and and not being able to kind of continue that momentum when they have the lead at half time because we've seen it before, especially at home as well. I think I think it's an experience thing. You know, mentality comes comes from experience, and there's a lot of young players in that squad. Speaking to Dan Neil after the game, as I mentioned earlier, who's who's only 21, speaks extremely well. You know, you can tell that he, he's a student of the game and that he reads the game. Um, but he, he's still early on in his career, and there's a lot of a lot of things to learn about playing in the championship. He he was at pains to to stress that. You know, that these things these things they all know, all of these young players know because they've played football for a long time. But it's about adjusting to the pace and, and the physicality and and the quality of, of the championship. It's it's a, a really tough league. Anybody can beat anybody. West Brom are a good side. I know Tony Mowbray got a bit of stick afterwards for mentioning that West Brom had a prolonged period in the Premier League, which I think he was he was right to point out in terms of where Sunderland have been in the recent history compared to West Brom. I know West Brom were in the Premier League for six six of those seasons or seven of those seasons at the same time as Sunderland. Um, so possibly that was a sort of out of context bad analogy. But the point he was getting at was that West Brom have been within in the Premier League in sort of the last four or five years. They've come up, they've come down. And they just have a, a bit of a different feel about their squad. There's a bit more experience there. And you're going to get days like this when when you do have an experience and it's going to take a lot of Sunderland's players a while to, to sort of, to gain that experience. It is a process. Um, uh, but you know, that there are a number of, of concern and trends. I do agree that the home form isn't the best and not being able to hold on to a lead isn't the best. And there's the corner thing as well, Joe. I think, I think Sunderland of, have had 96 corners, including that Sheffield Wednesday game in the Carabao Cup. So it's 93 in league games, and I haven't scored one of them, um, which is a real worry. So although there's been some great things this season and, and Sunderland are, are mid-table at the moment, it does feel like a bit of an opportunity missed because Sunderland could have gone uh, seventh place and 10 points off the bottom, um, which is crazy to say in terms of how congested the league is with a win. They didn't get that win. You know Blackburn coming up, they're a decent side, they're third. But then you look at um, you look at Wigan and Blackpool, who are in the bottom three. You'd expect some to get something from them. Hull as well on Saturday, isn't it? Isn't Hull it? as well, yeah. So it's yeah, it's it's tough. It's Sunderland feel hard to analyse at the moment. Coming off the back of a, a three 0 win against Millwall, you expect a bit better than that in the second half. But I can't quite put my finger on 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 what it is really with Sunderland. But I think you know this is where Mowbray earns his money. He needs to he needs to address those trends. He needs to get the set piece sorted. He needs to improve Sunderland's mentality. Um, make sure they start playing over ninety minutes a bit more, or as close to that as they possibly can, um, and and keep their head above water. Because you know we've said it a million times on this podcast. It only takes three or four games, and you can be right up there, or you can be right down there. Um, and at the moment, the league remains congested. You suspect it will probably sort of break away into two leagues um, in terms of a bottom half and a, and a top half at some point over Christmas. Um, but equally, it might not. Um, and if Sunderland don't start picking up results, you can find yourself a bit further down the table. And if they do play like they did in the second half against West Brom, against the likes of Blackburn, against the likes of Hull, against the likes of Wigan and against the likes of, of Blackpool, who will be up for it and who have players of their own merit, then you can get turned over in this division fairly often. Mm. Yeah, just looking at the table now, it's still incredibly congested. As you said, if Sunderland had won last night, they'd have been only a point off the playoffs. As it stands, they're 11th on 30 points, so four points off Preston in sixth. Um, they are six points above Wigan in 22nd. So with a lot of games kind of coming up over that festive period as well, We've got Hull on Saturday and then, um, it's Blackburn on Boxing Day, isn't it? Then they've got Wigan, then they've got Blackpool all before. Blackpool is on New Year's Day. So it can very easily turn with four games in kind of quick succession. If you win a couple on the bounce, you can be looking around the playoff places. If you lose a couple on the bounce, obviously you can be looking further down the table. And then you've got teams like West Brom, who Sunderland played like the last night. They're up to 17th in the table. I think they're a better side than what that suggests. It's now four wins in a row yeah, under Carlos think... Corbran. I think with with West Brom as well as is, is you have to give Corberan credit as you say unbeaten and four they were coming off the back of um, 
a long period with Steve Bruce at the club and it didn't go very well. Sunderland fans and Newcastle United fans are very familiar with what style of management Steve Bruce brings and, and when it goes wrong, it goes badly wrong and it can take time to recover. And I also think West Brom as well, you know, we're, we're playing, having lost the club doctor, he, he sadly passed away and that can really help galvanise a squad. I'm not using it as an excuse for Sunderland, I'm just trying to explain why West Brom maybe came out really firing in that second half because they, they'll have rightly wanted to to pay tribute to him and they will have wanted to do it for the fans as well who have who have travelled up um, in decent-ish numbers given given the conditions. So there's there's all these factors, all these factors come into play. Um, but we, we have a bit of, we tend to have a bit of recency and results bias, don't we? It's not, it, it doesn't feel like two minutes ago since we were, since we were waxing lyrical about Sunderland after the, the Millwall game. And, and looking ahead to this group of fixtures saying, yeah, we could, we could get, you know, nine or, or 12 points because we're playing well. And and now all of a sudden, because we've had a bad second half against West Brom, the mood suddenly feels a bit low. And I guess that's that's the life of a, a football fan or somebody that works in football. But maybe we do need to have a bit of a bit of perspective and, and say that, you know, look, it is the first season back in the championship. It's going to be difficult to turn all of these teams over because they are good teams, experienced teams at this level who who have experience in terms of the playing staff. So there's always going to be a period of adjustment. It just feels though that if Sunderland did have one or two more sort of one or two more additions in January, or had we strengthened a bit better in the summer or a bit more in the summer, that Sunderland could be pushing for the playoffs because they've they've proved they're capable of that. It's just frustrate frustrating that the consistency isn't there. And that you know injuries have, have perhaps you know let the squad down a little bit. I think it's that consistency of not just from game to game, it's within games. I think we've seen that Sunderland mm-hmm. can compete with the best sides in periods of games. For example, you look at that Burnley have probably been the standout team yeah. in the championship this season. Sunderland outplayed them for 45 minutes at the stadium light, but they couldn't do it for the full 90 minutes, and it is hard to do it against teams to dominate teams for 90 minutes, but Sunderland have shown they can do it in periods of games, but it's just finding that consistency over the full game. And I think we saw that again last night. That I thought they were excellent in the first half. I thought they pressed them really well. I thought um, West Brom didn't get too many opportunities to score. Sunderland kept them at arm's length, but there was, as we've seen before, a significant drop-off in the second half. And when you've got players who've got quality like Jed Wallace, who was, I think, a constant threat on, West Brom's right, and then they brought on substitutes that also impacted the game. You're going to get punished, and Sunderland found that out last night, as they have done in previous games. I also think it's a bit of a a bit of a feature and a trait of of modern football at the moment. If you're watching the World Cup, the standard and the quality, everybody's that good. You know, France, England is is a typical example where players are going to have moments in games. It's very very difficult to keep a side quiet. You know, even in the championship, because there's quality in the championship, Premier League, World Cup, it's very, very difficult actually to keep a side quiet for 90 minutes. There will there will be moments and the game hinges on moments. And unfortunately, West Brom got two of them. I mean, you look in the first half as well, Mowbray pointed out, and I think he was right to point it out, but Palmer makes a fantastic save from, yeah. from Pritchard. And Dan Neal was also adamant that, that Sunderland should have had a penalty in the second half. He, he thought it was an identical foul on Ahmad again up the other end than what it was in the first half. I haven't actually seen that back yet. But you know, the game could have the game could have hinged on those sorts of moments. And you could be looking at a, another Millwall scenario where Sunderland have won 3 0. It's just it's it's a strange old game. But what did you make of the subs, Joe? Um yeah, I saw some people like were critical of the subs, but I thought Mowbray and asked asked this to him afterwards. Um about the subs because he made his first change on the 58th minute so he did make quite an early sub by bringing on Clark for Embleton which I thought was quite a proactive change he, I think everyone could see that West Brom was starting to kind of get a grip of the game um, so he decided to bring Jack Clark on and, and take Embleton off which I think at the time was you could kind of understand the change Jack Clark's had an excellent season this season for Sunderland he's very direct he's very quick on the counter-attack and clearly that's what Mowbray was trying to kind of make with that substitution it didn't work out. Um, I think Clark was culpable, I think, particularly for the the equaliser when he allowed kind of Wallace to get into that position and, and cross from the right hand side. So but at the time you thought it could work out. But I think, as we said before, kind of Corbran used his subs very well by bringing on four substitutes before the 65th minute and they impacted the game. Um, 
And then the second one that the Mowbray made, he brought Dennis Serkin on, didn't he, and changed the shape, took off Dan Neal. Again, it didn't didn't really have the effect that he was looking for. I think what he was trying to do was shore it up on that left-hand side because I think Wallace was causing Elise quite a few problems. So he wanted to try and kind of double up on on that side with Serkin and Elise and, and the substitutes didn't work. Could he have maybe brought on someone like a Patrick Roberts a little bit sooner? Maybe, but I think in hindsight, that's kind of easier said now. Um, I just thought, thought it maybe showed that although someone did have options on the bench with the likes of Clark, and Roberts, maybe West Brom had a little bit more strength in depth on there. When you're bringing on players like Rogic, DK, Adam Reach is an experienced championship player as well, who came off the bench. Sunderland as well, still didn't have Ross Stewart on the bench, um, which I think we'll come on to later as well. So perhaps West Brom had a little bit more strength in depth there. Corbran was able to use his subs better. Um, I think it was a little bit frustrating, maybe for some fans, that they made a triple change with a minute to go, which just yeah. maybe seemed a little bit pointless at, at times. But... Um, but yeah, I, I don't think looking back, could he have done something differently? Maybe, but I think that's easier said in hindsight, isn't it? Than looking I, back now. I, th- I think it is. I don't think Tony Mowbray last night had the options on the bench to shear up that mm. midfield. You had you had Barr who who came on with a minute ago. We've seen that he's a, an exciting prospect with talent, but is he the man at the moment to to bring on and shear up a midfield in a championship game? Probably not in the same way a Corey Evans does. You know, we saw Dan Neal go off and then Alex Pritchard come sort of deeper. Um, I think Alex Pritchard can play deeper in a three maybe, but again, is he the man that's going to help Sunderland defensively see out see out the game in the championship? I, I don't think he is. I think, I think it comes back to something every... we've said since the summer, doesn't it, that they don't have a backup for Corey. Yeah, that's the point I was just about to make, is, yeah. is that, that that needs addressing for me because yeah. there isn't that... There isn't that player, that like for like player, or the experience other than Corey Evans. He, he sort of he holds a monopoly on both of those two things. He holds a monopoly on his position, and he holds a monopoly on um, on the experience in the midfield because he's, he's the only one who, who's got any really um, relatively com- compared to you know the, the makeup of the rest of the squad, which is great for him because he always plays. But <laughs> we've mentioned that you know his injury record towards the back end of Blackburn wasn't wasn't the best. So for me, that is a that is a must um, a, a must sort uh, item in the January transfer window for Christian Speakman and for for Stuart Harvey. And it's it is strange. I know I mentioned it last week, but you know we signed Bar and we signed Mishoot, who hasn't been mm. available, but. You got Dan Neil, Luke or Nine can can play midfield as well, although he hasn't much this season. But there's options there in in the middle. Embleton can play deeper, Pritchard can play deeper. So we've got all of these midfielders, but none of them can do what Corey Evans does. Yeah, there's no like recognised holy midfielder, is there? And we've said no. that since the summer, and we know that some were also trying to bring someone in on deadline day, weren't they? A holy midfielder, Mowbray's admitted that, and they didn't, I mean, they the, didn't work out. There, there is Mateta who. I think you know our colleague Phil Smith disagrees with us, um, but I think he could he could play a role in sort of breaking the play up. But I think was was he even on the bench last night? No, he I wasn't. Don't think, I don't no, think he was. I think he, I think he wasn't on the bench. Like, yeah. He's shown he's shown that potential, hasn't he? But we're still not sure. Is yeah, he a we should... deep line midfielder? Is he a number eight? Is he a well exactly Boxer exactly? And, and, and again and again, is he the man to come on and shore things up for Sunderland in the championship? Does he have that experience? Probably not. You know, as a club, Sunderland want to give him that experience so he can make his mistakes and develop into a good player. I get that; it's fair enough. Um, but it's just difficult when you go on go on to lose games. Uh, and I think that the Patrick Roberts one is a weird one as well at the moment because. He hasn't played much this season. He's clearly a quality player. We've all seen it. We know what he brings. Mowbray has, has stated several times that he sees him as one of the best players in the championship. Um, I was watching a video the club put out on YouTube the other day, and by all accounts, according to Alessa and Matete, Patrick Roberts is one of Mowbray's favourites. Um, yet he gets brought on with, with a minute to go. It's very difficult for a creative player to impact the game with a minute of normal time to go and then five minutes of added time. Mm. It's it's very strange, and you could say the same about Diaco as well. Obviously, not a player of of Roberts's pedigree and caliber quite yet. Um, we don't know if he'll he'll reach those heights. And, and different players, they are both as well. But and I know he started a couple of games before the World Cup. However, you bring them on with six minutes to go. What what can he do with a two one a two one down? It's it's tough. It, it puzzled me at the time, but I suppose he had to roll the dice at the end of the day. And had he not made those substitutions. 
he would have also received stick for, for mm. not making some substitutions at some point. So narratives hinge on results. And, and if one of those players had got an equaliser, Mowbray would have been a genius. But in terms of in terms of last night, it didn't work out. And he's, he's rightly receiving some stick. Yeah, I think Roberts is the one which you think maybe could have had the biggest impact on the game. But I just think with him, Ahmed Diallo's in such good form and he scored again yeah. yesterday. Um, it's now five goals in seven, isn't it? And they both play their best when they're out on that right-hand side, cutting in onto their left foot, Ahmad and Roberts, and it's very difficult to fit them both in the side. And Mowbray mentioned it after the Millwall game, you've got Ahmad, who's now got five goals and an assist in seven games. And with all due respect to Patrick Roberts, he, had, he did, wasn't matching those stats in terms of goal-scoring contributions when he was getting a run in, in the side, as, as talented a footballer as he, as he is. And we've all seen kind of his ability in the last kind of few months. And he's kind of had a bit of a resurgence since Mowbray's come in and Mowbray clearly likes him. But when Ahmad's playing that well, and I thought he was Sunderland's best attacking threat again last night against West Brom, you just can't leave him out. And if that's his best position, then unfortunately Patrick Roberts is going to have to find another way to get into the team. Or yeah. Mowbray said he's looking for solutions to, find, to fit them both in the team. But at the minute, he hasn't found one. So he'll obviously keep looking for that, won't he? Yeah, he will. And... You know, it's it's very difficult to to be positive after a two one win in which Sunderland played so badly in the second half. I completely understand that, but when you sort of step away from it and, and you think about the form of Ahmad, and I'm actually going to write something about this, but there are actually a, a fair few reasons for Sunderland fans to remain positive going into the sort of Christmas fixtures. You got Dan Ballard who who played for the under 21s yesterday he's on his way back he was sort of Sunderland's marquee signing in the summer really and he got injured after three games having looked very very good Ross Stewart is hopefully nearing a return as well mm. we mentioned but the Sunderland's next chunk of fixtures look kind on paper obviously you don't take anything for granted but Hull, Blackburn, Wigan and Blackpool Sunderland are easily capable of getting results in those games and you know the fourth one being that the January transfer window is just around the corner. So hopefully that midfield area does get addressed. Although Mowbray is sort of being quite, quite coy and has played January down. He isn't expecting too much, but you, you never know. That might be a, a sort of a tactic by the club. So there are reasons for Sunderland fans to, to remain positive, but no, I do understand it is difficult when, when Sunderland played that poorly in, in the second half and it was that cold. I think there still are a lot of positives, as, as you said, with, with Stewart's come back as well. And we've seen what Sunderland are capable of. It's, as we said before, it's just replicating, it, isn't it, over over a 90-minute spell. You mentioned Stewart there. Um, we asked Mowbray yesterday, will he be ready for the whole game? He said, uh, will he be fit for the whole game? I don't know. I'm not, I'm not a physio. Let's wait and see. So... Um, you took one for still... the you took one for the team asking that question, I think. Yeah, we'll, we'll see. Uh, we'll see if he's back, but it doesn't sound like it's again it's, it's anything too serious he said he felt a bit of discomfort after playing a behind closed doors game against Middlesbrough he felt just a little bit not worthy of a scan I think Mowbray was saying but um could still be back for that whole game but the or basically kind of emphasizing the point there's no need to risk him if there's any issue there you don't want him to break down again and be out for another few weeks so I think that's sensible especially with Ellis Sims who scored two and two before last night's game against uh, Birmingham and Millwall. So you've got kind of, although I think, you know, we agree that Stewart is is an upgrade on Sims. You've got, you've got a capable player there playing up front and there's no need to kind of throw Stewart back in there when he's, if he's not 100%. No, there isn't. I, I did think, I thought Ella Sims worked reasonably well last night in terms of his, his harrying and his chasing down the balls that he could chase down. Um, but I felt there was a, a bit of a disconnect from from Sims and Pritchard and Sunderland's attacking other attacking players on the wing. I didn't feel like they got close to Sims. I thought he was sort of feeding off scraps all night. And then obviously his concentration went for, for West Brom's equaliser. So I can understand why Sunderland fans want Stuart back and quickly because I completely agree. He's a different type of forward to Sims. He brings a different dynamic. He's one of the best forwards in the league. Um, there's just that contract question and, and situation uh, at the moment. And, and of course, when, when Stuart's name doesn't appear on the team sheets, when Sunderland fans were expecting him back, you know, everyone automatically jumps to the conclusion that he's going to be off in January and, and whatnot. So I think that's also contributing to the dark mood on Wearside, the fact that we haven't seen Ross Stewart 
yet. Um, but I thought Tony Mowbray seemed quite positive about about Stewart in the press conference. He, you know, he, he he was saying that it, it's right that Sunderland take the time because it is a muscle injury. And if you again, I'll mention it again. But if you consider just how cold it was last night at the stadium, of like the last thing you want is, you know, putting Ross Stewart on for the last twenty minutes when Sunderland are chasing the game and he does his muscle again and then he's out for another three or four months. That's just complete worst case scenario so you've got to think of the long-term picture and if he wasn't right he wasn't right and you want somebody like Ross Stewart right because he's an asset to the team and he's a, a monetary asset to the club um I, I think he I think I think he will be on the bench from for Hull that's me good feeling um whether he'll come on or not I'm not sure but you know having him back I think is going to be really really important for Sunderland coming into the Christmas Christmas period and beyond mm. Another thing that Mowbray said, I think this was after the Millwall game, actually, it was about kind of trusting his medical staff and trusting his, and if they're saying he's not quite ready to come yeah. back, then you've got to trust them. You've got to have that element of, of trust between your, between your staff. And and clearly, you know, they don't feel he's quite 100% ready. So why take the risk um, when you've got so much of the season to go? I think, as we said before, Sunderland are in a good position. They can really kick on when they've got players back, like Stewart. You've got Ballard as well, although... I'm not sure how Ballard's going to get back in the team if Luke O'Neill continues to play how he's been performing because yeah, he, exactly. was, he was excellent in the first half at centre-back and and we've said for a while I think his best position is at centre-back and he's he's formed quite a good partnership with Danny Bart there. Um, although Sunderland did concede two goals last night, O'Neill was probably, along with Ahmad, the standout player, would you agree? Yeah, I would say so. He, he looks really comfortable. He, he's, just, he's just doing the basics right. I thought early on in the season... Um, against Coventry off the top of my head and possibly against QPR. He could have actually been sent off a couple of times. I thought he struggled in a couple of games, um, was a bit rash, was a bit brainless at times as well. Obviously scored the own goal against uh, Watford. But whenever you think sort of Luke O'Nine's, whenever you count Luke O'Nine out or he comes in for a bit of criticism, he just goes back to basics and he, and he, he settles down. By all accounts, he trains extremely hard as well. Um, and his attitude sees him through. We know with the greatest of respect for him because he's played at a high level that I could ever hope to, but we know technically that he's not, you know, Berezi or Maldini or Cannavaro or something like that. But what he does is he just keeps it simple and does the basics well and is a player now with experience. He has a great mentality. Um, and I think he's silenced a lot of critics this season. You know, he's not the perfect championship, chip, uh, the perfect championship centre back, but neither's Danny Bart. Um, we all have strengths and weaknesses and and all nine on the ball at the back. He, he's been good. His work rate is is fantastic. Um but I think Bart does does deserve a lot of praise because he, he's experienced and um, more experienced than all nine now, especially playing in the championship and especially at centre back. And I think he's really helped all nine get through get through games. But credit to credit to Luke because I don't think there's many people that would have thought that Luke O'Neill could do a job for Sunderland at centre back in the Championship. I certainly didn't, but he's proved that he can. I do think that Dan Ballard in the long term will will displace him because um, I think he's just a higher quality. His physical stature, um, his pedigree coming from Arsenal, um, but you know, Luke O'Neill. I think that's his shirt until he until he loses it. Essentially, mm, definitely a lot of options there as well. As they could also switch to a back three. You think you've got. Bailey Wright's come back from the World Cup. You've got Elise, a good play at centre half. Um, Danny Bart's obviously had a great start to the season, and, and O'Neill's been performing well there. So there is obviously options at the back, and hopefully options as well um, moving forward. And Sunderland, as we've uh, kind of heard in the last kind of week or so, we'll be looking to strengthen in January as well, as I'm sure in, in a couple of positions that we've we've already mentioned. Um, we'll wrap it up there um, after. Sunderland's 2-1 defeat against West Brom. Next up for Tony Mowbray's side is a trip to Hull on Saturday. So we'll have uh, build up to that over on the SFC section of the Sunderland Echo website. We'll probably also have a podcast as well before them from someone from the, the Hull end to preview that match and see how they're getting on ahead of the game. So as I said before, you can head over to the SFC section of the Echo website for all the latest Sunderland news. Thanks again for listening to the Raw Podcast.